So we're starting in the sixth chapter of Romans today. If we look back at chapter 5, we see that the main theme in chapter 5 is peace with God and the certainty of salvation. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. When a person has been justified, that person has peace with God. There is no more guilt, no more condemnation. His sins are forgiven. He's declared righteous. The Apostle Paul further demonstrates the certainty of our salvation by showing the differences between being in Adam versus being in Christ. We talked about that. But let me review just for a moment before we jump into chapter 6. Uh, the Bible teaches that Adam was the head of the whole human race. He represented all of us. When Adam sinned, we all sinned in him. When Adam sinned, sin and death came to the whole human race. When Adam disobeyed God, it was just as if the whole human race disobeyed God because the whole human race was in Adam. That's what the Bible teaches. Adam's sin became our sin. His guilt became our guilt. His alienation from God became our alienation from God. Death engulfed the whole human race because of, because of Adam's one sin. He was our representative. Every person is born not in righteousness, not in innocence, but in guilt. Every person is born as a guilty sinner because of Adam's sin. Psalm 51 5 says, For I was born a sinner, yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. Everyone is born spiritually dead. Our natures are corrupted from birth. Our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked from birth. Adam's sin, his guilt, his alienation from God, his condemnation, his death, all of these things were imputed to the whole human race. We all became guilty sinners by virtue of being in Adam. But Jesus Christ came as the second Adam. He came as the new head of the human race. Jesus didn't sin. He was perfectly righteous. He didn't break the law. He kept the law. He fulfilled the law. He obeyed God perfectly. He lived a life of perfect righteousness. And he died for our sins and rose again. He defeated sin and death. When we, when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior... We are transferred from being in Adam to being in Christ. And just as we receive sin and guilt and condemnation and death from Adam because he was our head, now in Christ we receive righteousness, we receive justification, we receive eternal life because Christ is our head and we're in him. Because we've been transferred from being in Adam to being in Christ, we have peace with God. And we have the certainty of salvation. We've been united to Christ, and all that is his is now ours. In Adam, sin reigned. Sin ruled in our lives. In Christ, grace reigns. Grace rules in our lives. Now, as we go to chapter 6, there's a, a pause, a parenthesis in what Paul is talking about. He was talking about justification. He was talking about the certainty of our salvation in Christ. And he's going to pick up on this again uh, in Romans chapter 8 where it says in Romans 8, 1, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Chapter 8 continues in the theme of justification. It continues showing us the certainty of our salvation in Christ. But chapter 6 and chapter 7 form a break, uh, a parenthesis, so to speak, in his train of thought. And the reason is this. Paul knew that when he talked about the certainty of our salvation, when he showed us the sure hope that we have by being in Christ instead of Adam, he knew it would raise a couple of very important questions. And so he takes this parentheses to address these questions in chapter 6 and in chapter 7. And then in chapter 8, he goes back to what he was talking about in chapter 5. Well, what are these issues that he raises in chapter 6 and 7? In chapter 7, he talks about the law. Lord willing, we'll look at that when we get there. In chapter 6, where we are today, Paul will address a very important question. And so, look in your Bibles, look at chapter, uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 1. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. Romans 6, 1 says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? You know, you look at that question. Are, are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? Why does Paul stop his train of thought from chapter 5? Why does he stop to address this question? What, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? Why does he do that? That, that New Living Translation 
It says in Romans 6, 1, Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more kindness and forgiveness? So Paul must have anticipated this question. Perhaps there were people who, after seeing how free and wonderful and certain our salvation really is in Christ, perhaps there were people who thought, well, why not just keep sinning? Why not just keep sinning? God's grace is always available. I'm saved. Why not just keep sinning? Paul anticipated that people would use the grace of God as a license to keep on sinning. Now, now why, why was that? Why did Paul anticipate that there would be a question like this? When Paul preached the gospel, when he preached what it is to be saved, he made certain that people knew they were not saved by good works. He made certain that people knew they weren't saved by trying to keep the law. In Romans 3.20, it says, For no one can ever be made right in God's sight by doing what his law commands. For the more we know God's law, the clearer it becomes that we aren't obeying it. So Paul made sure that his hearers knew they would never, ever, ever be saved by doing what God's law commanded. He made sure they knew they were saved by grace. In Ephesians 2.8, it says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast. And so he really made sure of this. And he made, he made sure that people really knew just how much God, uh, just how much grace God really pours out on sinners, how much grace he really pours out. Romans 5, 8, it says, but God showed us his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us, not when we were good, we aren't. He died for us while we were sinners, while we were his enemies. And so Paul taught that God's free gift of grace through Jesus Christ brings eternal life to all who believe and Paul taught that God's grace is so great that wherever sin increased, God's grace increased even more. Romans 5.20, And the law came in that the transgression might increase, but where sin increased, grace bounded all the more. And so Paul rightly emphasized, we're not saved by our works. We're not saved by being good. We're not saved by keeping God's commandments. We're saved simply, simply by the grace of God, through faith in Jesus Christ. We won't stand before God in our, in our own righteousness. We'll stand before God in Christ's righteousness. We're in Christ and we're standing in his righteousness. All of our sins are forgiven. When Christ died on the cross, he died for our sins. And we weren't even born yet. The Lord sees the end from the beginning. Isaiah 46, 10. All of our sins, before we were even born, Christ died for those sins. All of our sins are forgiven past, present, and even future sins judicially are forgiven. All our guilt is washed away. We're no longer in Adam, but forever in Christ. We're no longer alienated from God, but we are forever his children, his beloved children. And Paul even says, wherever sin increased, grace increased more. And so Paul was really trying to very much explain the amazing gospel of Jesus Christ, which the more that we read it and understand it, the, the greater it, if we can take it into our heart and understand it deeply, it's, it's, it's always greater than we even think. And Paul knew that when he really showed how salvation is free and how it's completely of the Lord and how Jesus did it all. And when that we are in Christ, we have his righteousness, we have total forgiveness, not dependent in any way upon our works. Paul knew that when he said that, and, that would he, and then when he added, wherever sin increases, grace increases even more. Paul knew he would get a question like this. Well then, Romans 6, 1, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more kindness and forgiveness? Are we to continue to sin so that grace may increase? It's a natural question to ask in light of what Paul had just written. If we've been saved by God's loving grace, if Jesus did it all, if we're taken care of in every single way by simply being in Christ, and on top of that, the Bible's saying where sin increases, grace increases even more. You could see how someone might say, I'm saved, I'm taken care of. So why bother doing good works? Now, hopefully a Christian actually wouldn't say that. But Paul anticipated that someone would ask that, and that's why he stops and raises this question. Someone might say, I'm saved, I'm taken care of, so why bother doing good works? In fact, if God's grace increases when I sin, why not sin more? 
There have always been people who have used God's free gift of loving grace as a license to sin. There was a Russian monk, and maybe some of you have heard of him. His name was Gregory Rasputin. Maybe some of you, you know, you can even look it up if you ever want to. He, he was kind of a mystic. He was really different. There was a Russian monk named Gregory Rasputin who taught that we should not give up sin, but rather we should sin more and that we should sin notoriously. He taught that those who sin the most will require the most forgiveness and they will therefore experience the most grace. He taught that when a sinner continues to sin, he's in, in, in an uninhibited manner. When a sinner sins without restraint, when that sinner repents, he will enjoy each and every time more of God's loving grace than just an ordinary sinner. And so he taught, don't be an ordinary sinner. Sin with abandon. Sin deeply and enjoy more of God's grace. Now, is that kind of off the wall? It doesn't match up with Scripture, does it? But that's what this guy taught. There have always been people who use God's amazing grace as a license to sin. But is this right? Is this right? L listen to what the Bible actually says. Romans 6, 1, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? Verse 2, may it never be. May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? The Bible does teach that where sin increases, grace increases more. But it most certainly does not teach us to sin more as a result so that grace will increase more. It does not teach that. Romans 6, 2 says, may it never be. How, will we, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? Let me mention something about the gospel. When the gospel is preached right, when the gospel is preached right, it can sound as if you're giving people a license to sin. In fact, this might sound strange, but just hear me out. It's actually a good test as to whether or not you're preaching the gospel correctly or not. If someone could come to the conclusion that you are preaching a gospel that gives you a license to sin. If someone could come to that conclusion, you're not saying that, but if someone could come to that conclusion, you're actually probably preaching it right. Now, now the gospel doesn't give you a license to sin. And if you think that way, you're, you're thinking wrongly. But consider this. The Bible teaches that we're saved by grace and grace alone through faith in Jesus Christ. It teaches very definitely that we're not saved by works and none of our works contribute to it in any way. There's nothing we can do as far as works are concerned for our salvation. We are most definitely not saved by works and we're not kept in our salvation. We're not kept in our salvation by works. We're held in our salvation by the Lord himself. John 10, 28 says, and I give eternal life to them and they shall never perish and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. Christ himself said, you're in my hand. No one can take you out. Not even you. The Holy Spirit seals us. On top of this, the Holy Spirit seals us under the day of redemption. In Ephesians 4.30, it says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit, the omnipotent power of the Holy Spirit, seals us to the day of redemption. And so we're not saved by works. We're not kept by works. We're saved by God's grace. We're held securely by God himself. He'll never let us go. No one can snatch us out of his hand, not even ourselves. We're no longer in Adam. We're, we're united to Jesus Christ. And we have been given the very righteousness of Christ, given to us, accounted to us on our judicial account before the Lord, in the Lord's court. When we stand before God, we'll be seen in Christ's righteousness. All of our sins have been completely forgiven, paid for by Christ himself. The Bible says we've been declared perfect, and we've been declared perfect forever. In Hebrews 10, 14, one of my favorite verses, it says, By one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. And so our, our salvation is free. It's not earned. We're kept in it by God himself. It's secure. Our righteous standing before God has been declared by God himself. We're saved by the work of Jesus Christ, God the Son. By his blood, we're forgiven of all of our sins. And we have all of this because God's tremendous grace, which he's bestowed upon us. And when we sin, when sin increases, grace increases even more. A person hearing the gospel, the true gospel, gospel could think, 
I don't have to earn my way to heaven. That'd be a, a correct thought. I don't have to try to hang on to my salvation. God hangs on to it. That's a correct thought. I don't have to worry about losing my salvation. God's grace is greater than my sin. A person could come uh, to the conclusion, I think I will just get saved and then go and sin. Now, there's a reason why someone actually who is saved won't come to that conclusion. And we can come to that later. It's probably going to be in the next sermon, actually, not this one. But a person who preach, preaches the amazing grace of God and the salvation of sinners is going to preach a gospel that could sound like it gives a license to sin. In fact, many Christian preachers have been accused of preaching a gospel that leads to sin. They've been accused of preaching too much grace. And that even happens. And there's preachers who will not preach this much grace because they think, if I preach this much grace, I'm going to be the cause of licentiousness. Not true, except for a person who already has a heart that would go that way anyway. The Jews thought, the Jews thought in Paul's day, you need to have grace plus works. And there's churches today that still preach grace plus works. But the real gospel says all grace, no works. All grace, no works. The gospel preached in its true and fullest sense has always been taken by some people as a license to sin because it is so free, it's so full of grace, it's so secure that some people have always thought, I can be saved and I don't have to give up my sin. And this is obviously a misunderstanding of the gospel. But that's why Paul asks this question in Romans 6.1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? And so Paul raises this question, because the gospel is so full of grace, and I hope if you didn't know the gospel was that full, so full of grace, I, I hope you know now, and I would encourage you to read a small little booklet by Milton Vincent called The Gospel Primer, and when you read that short little book, it will just assure you how full of grace the gospel really is. Now, the gospel can sound like a license to sin, but it's not. Jude, Jude verse 4, it's only one chapter, that's why it's Jude verse 4. It says, For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. And so it's not a license to sin. Now, Let's look at how Paul answers this question. It says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means we died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? The Christian is not to sin any in order to in increase God's grace. He's not to go on living in sin because he thinks the gospel gives, gives him a license to sin. Paul says, by no means should we go on living in sin. We've died to sin. Now I want to switch gears right here in this sermon. Okay. And I'm, I'm close to being done. You guys, it's nice to be in here and be warm anyway, isn't it? I want to switch gears right here. We're looking at a very important text. And it's going to feel like I'm starting a new sermon right near the end of this sermon. The Bible says we died to sin. Romans 6, 2. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? That's what Paul said. That was his answer. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? What does this mean? What does this mean? There are many misunderstanding, misunderstandings of this key phrase, we die to sin. I want to give you a few examples of what this very important verse doesn't mean. And then, Lord willing, next Sunday, I'll tell you what it does mean. That seems like kind of a, a mean thing to do, but otherwise the sermon will get too long. Okay, so it's going to be a to-be-continued to be sermon. So you just got to come back next sun, Sunday if you want to get the rest of this. But let me give you a few examples of what this very important verse doesn't mean. Romans 6, 2, we died to sin. How can we live, it, live in it any longer? So we died to sin. One way people wrongly interpret this verse is when they say the Christian is no longer responsive to sin. We died to it. This is actually a popular view. It goes something like this. Since the Bible says we died to sin, we're like a dead corpse when it comes to sin. We don't respond to sinful stimuli. We don't respond to sinful temptations. We don't respond to sinful allurements. I, I think of deer hunting. Many of you hunters will be able to relate to this. When you shoot a deer and you track it and you find it when it's laying there, 
you want to make sure it's dead before you touch it. You really do. Most of the time you can tell, but there's times when you can walk up to a deer, and if you're not absolutely sure if it's, you, you, you aren't absolutely sure if it's dead or not, if you go up to a, a deer and you think it's dead, but it's not, you could get hurt really bad, especially if it's a, a, a deer with big antlers. Isn't that true? So sometimes hunters will, when they walk up to the deer, they'll take a stick or an arrow and kind of give the deer a poke. And if it doesn't respond, then you know it's dead. That's how some people interpret this verse. They say the phrase, we have died to sin, means that sin can poke us and we won't respond. We're dead to it. We can run into sinful temptation, sinful stimuli, sinful allurement. We can run into situations that often bring sin out of people and we won't even respond. The true believer is dead to sin. Well, let me tell you right now, even though that's an interpretation out there, it is most definitely a wrong interpretation. Two reasons prove it wrong immediately. One, in Matthew 6, 13, Jesus tells us to pray and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Jesus wouldn't tell us to pray for deliverance from temptation if we were unresponsive to sinful temptations. And the other reason we know that this is a wrong interpretation is just simply because of our own experience proves it wrong. Can any of us say that we are unresponsive to sinful stimuli? All of us struggle with sinful temptations, and we'll say so if we're honest. To say that we are unresponsive, to say we're dead to sinful temptations, it's just, it's just simply not true. If a person thinks that way, they're self-deceived. Sometimes we actually, every day I would say, we have to fight sinful desires and temptations with all of our might. When the Bible says we've died to sin, it does not mean we are like an unresponsive dead corpse. Now let's, let's look at another way people wrongly interpret this verse. People wrongly interpret this verse when they say the Christian should die to sin. It's certainly true. We should leave off sinning as best as we can. We should become more and more like Christ as we mature in our Christianity. We should deny ourselves and take up our cross daily and follow Jesus. Some people would say that's what dying to sin is. And they would say Romans 6.2 is telling us we should die to sin. That might sound good, but Romans 6.2 is not really telling us that we should die to sin. It's telling us that we have died to sin. The word died is in the past tense. It's something that's already happened. It's not something you need to do over and over again. And you'll see why this is important when we get to the correct interpretation of this passage. But it's not telling us what we should do. It's telling us what we've already done. Let's look at another way people wrongly interpret this verse. People wrongly interpret this verse when they say the Christian is dying to sin day by day. When a person says this, he is really talking about becoming more holy day by day. We're, we're to be growing in holiness. This is certainly true. We should be putting off our sinful thoughts and words and deeds every day. But again, Romans 6.2 is in the past tense. It says we died to sin, past tense. We're not dying to sin day by day. This is something that's happened once and forever to every believer. It's not a process. It's not something that takes a lifetime to complete. We die to sin once and forever in one single moment. Let me give you just one, uh, maybe a couple more quick ways to, that people wrongly interpret Romans 6.2. When the Bible says we died to sin, some people would say the Christian cannot continue in sin because he's, re, he's renounced sin. This view was actually espoused by Charles Hodge. He's a, he was a professor, a great professor at Princeton Theological Seminary. And I'd be very hesitant to disagree with someone of his stature. But, I, but, I, but other theologians disagree, and so I'm with the other ones in this case. Like James Mon- Montgomery Boyce and D. Martin Lloyd-Jones have pointed out how that view is also wrong. The, the, when the Bible says we have died to sin, the Bible will show us how this is not something that we have done first. I mean, here's the, the Christian cannot continue in sin because he's renounced sin. That's what it's saying. When the Bible says we have died to sin, the Bible will show us how this is not something we've done for ourselves. It, it's something that's been done for us. And so if we say we've renounced sin, well, that's the wrong interpretation because this is not something we do. This is something that's done for us. Okay? And because the timing is time to stop, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save that for next week's sermon. Suffice it to say, when the Bible says we have died to sin... It doesn't mean we've renounced sin, though we should renounce sin. Let me, let me just give you one more wrong interpretation really quickly. When the Bible says we died to sin, 
people wrongly interpret this verse when they say it means the Christian has died to sin's guilt. This is true, we have died to sin's guilt, but this passage means more. So let me, let me just conclude by asking us, are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? The answer is a clear no. We're not to use God's grace as a license of sin, but at the same time, the reason why that question is even raised is because the gospel, if it's preached right, God's grace is so emphasized, salvation is so free, it's so secure, it's so sure, it's so certain that it can be taken to be a license to sin. Think about that, how wonderful God's grace really is. You don't have to work for it. Indeed, you can't work for it. The gospel is completely free for the taking. And, and think about what you're given, complete and total forgiveness through the shed blood of God the Son, Jesus Christ. You're given the very righteousness of Christ. You're declared righteous and without guilt by God himself. And the salvation is permanent, it's forever, it's irrevocable, it can't be lost. You're sealed securely into until the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit, you're held in the very hand of God, and where sin increases, grace increases. The gospel is so wonderful, so secure. God's love is so enduring. The gospel has been mistaken for and used as a license to just keep on sinning because it is such a great gospel. It's so done. It's so complete. It's so secure forever. It is sometimes taken to be as a license to sin because it's so great and that's why Paul addresses this issue, issue when he says, may it never be. But if you hear a gospel that doesn't sound this good, if you hear a gospel that couldn't be taken that way, it's not the gospel of Christ. If you hear, Christian, if you hear a gospel that says you can lose your salvation, that's a gospel that's grace plus works automatically. It is, and it's not true. If you hear a gospel that you have to work for in any way, it's not the gospel. If you hear a gospel that's faith plus works, faith plus the law, faith plus the commandments, you're not hearing the wonderful grace-filled gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is so good that someone with the wrong heart about it could take it as a license of sin. Paul says, may it never be. How can he who died to sin still live in it? Now, we went over some wrong interpretations of that. Next Sunday, Lord willing, I want to tell you what this verse actually means, that we have died to sin. I want to tell you what it means, but that's another sermon. It's a whole sermon. So I'm going to stop right here and let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for how great, amazingly great the gospel really is. Lord, bless this time together as we continue to discuss things. And Lord, give us wisdom and give us guidance. And thank you for all those who could come out tonight. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.